As someone who's successfully founded multiple businesses, I cannot overstate how important it is to have a single source of truth for your business, for inventory, for revenue, and on and on. There's an amazing tool called NetSuite that can help you do just that. Visit netsuite.com slash SPI to download their KPI checklist for free and support this podcast. If you do find yourself buried in manual work or struggling to have a clear picture of your business, you should know three numbers, 37,000, 25, and one. 37,000, that's the number of businesses which have upgraded to NetSuite by Oracle. Number 25, well, NetSuite turns 25 years old this year. That's 25 years of helping businesses do more with less, close their books in days, not weeks, and drive down costs. And the number one, because your business is one of a kind. So you get a customized solution for all of your KPIs in one efficient system with one source of truth. Manage risk, get reliable forecasts, and improve margins. Everything you need to grow all in one place. And right now, download NetSuite's popular KPI checklist designed to give you consistently excellent performance absolutely free at netsuite.com slash SPI. That's netsuite.com slash SPI to get your own KPI checklist. netsuite.com slash SPI. There's a better way to create a website, a professional, crisp website you'll be proud to publish, and it just takes seconds. This is all thanks to Hostinger's AI website generator. I recently took this for a test drive, even shared this on my YouTube channel. It was mind-blowing. Not just how quick you can build a website, but with the AI, how great it actually can write copy for you. You can use the AI logo maker, plus it got it up in no time, and it looks good. Absolutely mind-blowing. So if you want to build a website, go to Hostinger, because they're a top, highly rated global web hosting platform. And all you have to do to build a website is just answer three questions and let the AI do all the work for you. You can build as many web pages as you need without knowing how to code a single line of anything. They have great support, too. That was one thing that I had a problem with with a with a with another host back in the day. Hostinger has 24-7 support and a library of video guides. And here's the thing. You can do this for less than $3 a month, including a free domain name. That is crazy. So create a live website now at hostinger.com slash SPI. And listeners of this podcast, you can enter SPI for 10% off your order and a free domain name, H-O-S-T-I-N-G-E-R dot com slash SPI and use the code SPI for 10% off and a free domain name. Give it a spin. I wanna quiz you. Do you know what this quote means? Have you ever heard of this quote? Vision without action is a daydream. Action without vision is a nightmare. What do you think that means? Well, the first part of it, vision without action, it's a daydream, essentially means, well, if you have this big idea, but you never do anything about it, well, it'll just continue to be a daydream, a wish, something that will never happen, but you can think about. But the opposite, the worse one, action without vision is a nightmare. Well, that's doing things without knowing exactly where you wanna go, Sort of like a car that you drive around without any sort of destination. Well, how do you even know which way to turn, which way to go? Eventually, you're going to run out of gas and potentially burn out. And we don't want that to happen. Today, a special guest is joining us here on the show. His name is Michael Hyatt. You might have heard of him before in the leadership space. He's been a guest here on the show several times in the past, one of our favorites, actually. And he has a book that just came out literally last week called The Vision Driven Leader. 10 questions to focus your efforts, energize your team, and scale your business. And we've talked a lot about taking the approach as a business owner, as somebody who uh, sort of steps into the CEO role. Even if you're just a solopreneur, the difference between a scrappy entrepreneur that sort of reacts, that sort of comes at it day by day, versus the one who plans. And whether you have a big team or a small team, that plan, that vision, that execution behind that is gonna be key to your success. So today I'm excited to bring Michael on to talk a little bit about what a vision actually is, how do we structure it, how do we understand it, how do we define it so that our teammates can understand it too. And whether you have employees or not, this is gonna be something that's really, really beneficial to understand because we need that direction, we need that vision because we don't want our business, our dreams to become a nightmare. So first, let's get to the music. Welcome to the Smart Passive Income Podcast, where it's all about working hard now so you can sit back and reap the benefits later. And now your host, he secretly wishes he could work on a movie at Pixar, Pat Flynn. Want to stop grinding through resumes and just meet your match already? Well, you can with Indeed. If you need to hire, you need Indeed your matching and hiring platform. With over 350 million global monthly visitors, according to Indeed data, plus their matching engine helps you find quality candidates fast. 
and it works like really fast. In fact, by the time this ad's over, 23 new hires will have been made on Indeed, according to Indeed Data Worldwide. It's the perfect match of speed and quality. 93% of employers agree Indeed delivers the highest quality matches compared to other job sites. And I think Indeed is the place to go. It's easy to manage. Everything is in just one spot. The interview process, it's scalable with you and your business as it grows. Like there's no other platform you would need than Indeed. And listeners of this show will get a $75 sponsored ad job credit to get your jobs more visibility at indeed.com slash smart passive. Just go to indeed.com slash smart passive right now and support our show by saying you heard about Indeed on this podcast. Indeed.com slash smart passive. Terms and conditions apply. You need to hire, you need Indeed. We entrepreneurs are at our desks a lot. So having solid equipment is super important. And a sit stand desk can make a huge difference, as many folks on our team will attest to. If you haven't tried one yet, this offer from Uplift is for you. Plus, you can support the show at the same time. Visit upliftdesk.com slash SPI for 5% off your order. Over a million customers have chosen Uplift Desk. Innovative product designs, reasonable pricing, same-day shipping, free accessories with every desk. You can see why they're such a big hit. And did I mention the industry-leading 15-year warranty? And that covers the complete desk, by the way, not just the top or some fine print like that. Moving while you work is just healthier. An Uplift Desk provides a state-of-the-art experience. They're stable, made of very solid materials. There's over 100 desktop choices and customizations available. Just the choices for material for your desk are amazing, all the way from laminate to eco to bamboo to solid wood. If you want to build a workstation of your dreams, I highly recommend checking them out. Go to upliftdesk.com slash SPI for 5% off your order. That's U-P-L-I-F-T desk.com slash SPI to get 5% off your entire order. What's up, everybody? Welcome to session 417 of the Smart Passive Income Podcast. My name is Pat Flynn, here to help you make more money, save more time, and help more people too. And today, like I said, we have a dear, dear friend of mine, Michael Hyatt. We actually went fly fishing together last year through Wyoming and Idaho, and it was awesome. We talked a lot, and I'm excited because I learned about this book, Coming Your Way, and it is available now on Amazon. Again, that's The Vision Driven Leader. So here he is, Michael Hyatt from michaelhyatt.com. Michael, welcome back to the Smart Passive Income Podcast. Thanks for being here again. Thanks, Pat. It's so good to be on again. You know, every time you come on, you have something amazing to share, and this time related to your upcoming book, Vision. Vision is so important. And I think that most entrepreneurs, we often dive into something without fully realizing the vision of where we want to go. And we want to get our hands dirty so quickly. But why is it a mistake to sort of take action without first thinking about where we want to go and the vision that we have? Yeah, well, to use a metaphor, it's almost like jumping in the car with your entire family and say, hey, let's go on a trip. Where are we going, dad? Not really sure, but it's going to be fun. You know, you could waste a lot of resources, spend a lot of time and be very busy the entire time and never get to a destination that's meaningful. And so I think that's that's true in an organization too. You know, there's so much sideways energy, so much waste of resources when we're not clear about the destination. And I think even, you know, in productivity, which is a space that I've written a lot about and I know is a particular interest to you, Pat, you know, productivity without a vision, you can end up very busy doing a lot of stuff that doesn't really matter at the end of the day. And I think that the secret to having more margin in your life to having a business that you run instead of a business that runs you is to have a clear vision where you can create alignment and then drive the execution around that vision. Well, here's my question around that because I know as an entrepreneur, sometimes we don't fully know exactly where we're going. And, and we often hear, especially from people like Seth Godin, you know, uh, just ship, right? And then kind of ready, fire, aim, right? So how yeah. does your thoughts about, you know, finding a vision versus, well, we have to take action somewhere and a business plan is just kind of a a best guess. How do we, how, how do we balance that? And what is truly how the, the methods for, for really realizing this vision that you were speaking of? That's a great question. And certainly you're not going to have the kind of clarity at the beginning of the process that you'll develop as you move toward the objective. But I still think it's important to take a stab of it at it just because you can't have absolute clarity doesn't mean that that you shouldn't try. You know, to have a vision for where you're going is critically important in terms of shaping your activities. Like I I tell the story in the book, In the Vision Driven Leader, where I started the publishing company back in 1984, and we had all kinds of energy. We had investors, we had a mission, and we were certainly had lots of opportunities. But unfortunately, because we didn't have a vision, there was no filter 
to really help us to determine where we were going to put our resources, where we were going to put our effort. And as a result, we were kind of just every opportunity became a new thing that we pursued. And it was at the end of the day, it was our opportunities that were our undoing because they were all over the map and we were just spread too thin. So a vision provides that focus. It provides that clarity that directs our actions so we don't squander our resources, so that we don't waste our energy, so that it's focused and so that it you know, has an outcome that we're pursuing. It makes me think of, and, and I'm really bullish on Tesla right now at this time of recording, you know, the stock is up like crazy. There's a lot of fun and exciting news happening in the world of Tesla. And it makes me think of their sort of mission and vision, which is to accelerate the world's transition to sustainable energy. And a lot of us have heard of obviously Elon Musk and his sort of overall plan to uh, change the world. And it started with the vision of just, okay, we want sustainable energy, but then it started to help him determine, okay, well, what might the steps be to make that happen? And, and of course, he started with the Roadster, a higher level car that he was going to sell for lots of money to a few people that would then uh, supply the income and resources for the Model S, which came out in 2012 uh, around that time, which then made money to then make the more uh, production ready Model 3, which has just recently come out and, and, and it's coming in stages. But obviously, it's always, always based on this vision of accelerating the world's transition. And it couldn't have happened with the Model 3 at first. And so, you know, we the hard thing is Elon is just in another world, but I think that we can all benefit from uh, seeing these things that we want to get into in, in such a way kind of far into the future. How do we begin to determine what our vision is? Do you have any thoughts or questions or exercises that we can do right now to figure this out? Absolutely. Well, I think, first of all, it's important to define what a vision is. And so in the book, I define it in this way. I say vision is a clear, inspiring practical and attractive picture of your organization's future. In other words, it's something that's uh, a superior state to where you are right now. Typically, I recommend to our business coaching clients, we have about 500 people in our program right now, business owners, that it needs to be about three years from now. You know, beyond that, technology is changing so fast that for most businesses, and there are some exceptions, but for most businesses, beyond that, it's just a wild guess. Less than that, and it's not going to be strategic. So a written statement uh, really a script, I call it. A statement's not sufficient, but a script that encompasses four areas where you talk about your team, your products, your marketing, and your impact in the world. And so it needs to be written, and it needs to be written in the present tense. But this is not something, you know, you're going to cook up by, you know, going into the mountains and meditating and having some mystical experience. This is more like, you know, just like when you're trying to draft a blog post or draft anything, you know, you end up with, with something that approximates what you want to do, but you're going to refine and edit it over time. But I recommend to people that are trying to formulate a vision to get away for a day and to go through a series of questions. In fact, I have these questions in the book. They're vision prompting questions because I know how difficult it is for most people to sit down and, and stare at an empty screen. You know, it could be quite intimidating so this is almost like, not quite, but almost like paint by number. So I have a series of questions that if you did nothing but answer these questions, you would have probably 85 to 90% of your vision script done. And is this something you do on your own or do you do it with other members of your team together? I highly recommend that you start by doing it alone. You know, I've been a part of a process where I worked for a company where the CEO came in and said, look, our investors are asking me what my vision is. I'm not really a vision kind of guy. So I went and appointed a committee to figure out the vision and he put me in charge of it. Well, it would have been awesome if he'd had a seat at the table or if he'd given us some, you know, kind of idea of where he wanted to go. But this is not something you could delegate. This is something that I think is integral to being a good leader. Vision or being a leader means that you're leading people somewhere. Well, where's the somewhere? You know, where is, where is the destination you're taking everybody? So I recommend that you get alone. You get very clear, you know, step into the future, stand in the future, as it were. Use your imagination, which is, a, I, I think, a God-given faculty that we have to begin creating the future, and describe what you see. Write it down. Write it in the present tense as though it were already happening. And then, once you get that first draft, then it's time to go back to the team and say, look, I've been thinking a lot about vision and where we're going. And this isn't perfect. It needs a lot of work. This is just a draft. But in order to take it to the next level, I need your input. That's when you share it and really invite their input. What did I miss? What did I not, I not seeing clearly? You know, what, what could be improved here? 
then you in that in that process you're beginning to create buy-in so that it becomes not just your vision but a collective vision but it will also ask to act as a filter for people that just say you know that's not really what I signed up for and that's fine you know you want people that are aligned around that vision the right vision will attract the right people and repel the wrong people how do you differentiate between this vision that we're creating and scripting out for ourselves and just our wish list of things with that we hope will happen. I think a lot of entrepreneurs, we have ideas of where we want to go, but because it feels more like a wish and almost so far into the future that we, we don't even know how to get there, it almost feels deflating sometimes when we see this vision or this wish list that we've created and we go, oh man, I got a lot. I don't even know where to begin on this. And it almost is sometimes deflating, I've heard from people. So how do, how do you create the vision without deflating yourself but get excited about it at the same time. Yeah, I, I think that's where the three-year time horizon, you know, makes sense because you know it needs to be something that you could see reasonably happening in a three-year time frame. But one of the things that's really critically important to do is to suspend that how question, because if a vision, if it's properly formulated, you're not going to see the entire how. Vision has to precede strategy, and I've said this in my book, Your Best Year Ever, when it comes to goal setting. But once you get clear on the vision, what you're trying to accomplish, then the strategy has a way of showing up. Until you get clear on what you, where you want to go, it doesn't really matter how you're going to get there. That only becomes relevant once you get clear on where it is you want to take uh, your company. So yeah, so it's going to be in your discomfort zone. There's going to be parts of it that make you uncomfortable, and that's how it should be. If it's something that doesn't make you uncomfortable, and it's just in the realm of kind of business as usual, and it recommends sort of relies on an incremental gain, that's not really vision. That's not going to inspire anybody, mm -hmm. probably not even you. Right. Do you have an example from your own business, a vision that you had and created, or you didn't quite yet know exactly how it was going to happen three years or so into the future? And then can you tell us how you figured out what to do to realize that vision? Yeah. So one example of that is that, you know, we had this vision of really helping leaders and we thought, you know, it'd be awesome if we could do something in the realm of coaching. So initially we thought, well, let's just take my best-selling course, uh, Five Days to Your Best Year Ever, and let's create a coaching program for those that want to go deeper around it. And so that, that worked kind of. And we did the same thing with my Free to Focus course on productivity. We did, we called them activation workshops. And we did a deeper dive for people that want to go deeper in that. What we didn't see at the time was that people wanted to marry those two things together so that they were both pursuing goals, but doing the productivity thing together. So we kind of zagged from that and went into our business accelerating uh, coaching program, which has just taken off like crazy. We've got about 500 clients in that program now, and it's become more than half of our business. So, you know, a lot of times at the beginning of a vision, you kind of have sort of, you know, it's, it's, it's almost like the Bible says, you know, we see through a glass darkly. You know, we, we don't have the clarity that we might need when we get there, but it gets us set in the right direction. And the clarity comes as we begin to make progress. So that's, that's just an example. I love that. Thank you for that. What are some of these questions that we could prompt ourselves with and maybe even think about? I'd like to perhaps navigate some of those uh, for those who might be getting into the book later. Yeah, cool. So again, I, I talk about a vision script, not a vision statement. One of the things I found, Pat, was when I was trying to do create a vision for my company, I thought I had to come up with this short, pithy, you know, clever thing that you could put on a t-shirt or a coffee mug and would just motivate the heck out of everybody. Right, right. That, that's like an impossible burden for anybody to create. I mean, maybe, you know, there's occasionally a person that can do that, but for the rest of us that are mere mortals, that becomes an impossible task and it actually inhibits the process. So I said, what if we made that a vision script, something that actually was not so long that it was daunting, but long enough where we could flesh it out and actually describe what we see in four key areas. So I start with team. Team is critically important. I think that's the first and most important priority as we're beginning to fulfill our vision and move into the future is to think about what kind of team it's gonna take. I've often said that if your dream doesn't require a team, your dream is too small. So the team is gonna be the primary vehicle, the primary mechanism by which you get to the future. It's gonna take the collective effort of several people, maybe a lot of people, that are, that are gonna to help to accomplish that vision. So here are some of the questions that I ask around team. What kind of teammates do you wanna attract? What characteristics do they share in common? How do they work? What is their work ethic? 
What do you do to attract top talent? What is your compensation philosophy? What does your benefits package look like? By the way, this was a huge breakthrough for us when we began to think of prospective employees as customers that we had to sell on the product, which was the company. So we began to think of our company as a product, and we built out a sales page, which we call our careers page. You can see it at michaelhyatt.com slash careers, but a sales page that would sell our company to prospective clients because, or prospective employees because we wanted to attract the right people. And then we began to think, what kind of benefits would we have to, to have that would really attract the best top talent? So that's where we got to the place where we said, you know, we want to cover 100% of healthcare. We want to give people unlimited paid time off. We want to give people a 30-day paid sabbatical every three years. You know, we want to give people a personal development allowance every year that they're not accountable to. They can just use it to spend on a hobby or something else that enriches their life even outside of work. So this, this all came from this vision and answering these questions. But then there's these three other sections. There's a section in the vision script on product. What is it about your products? You know, like what products do your, uh, or what results do your products create? What value do they deliver? Who do your products help? How do your customers feel when they use your products? What's the user experience like? Then there's a section on sales and marketing. You know, what markets do you serve? How large is your customer base? How do you reach them? And then impact, what are the results? Or what metrics are you using to, that are meaningful to you and your team in terms of defining the win ahead of time? So anyway, all that leads to a first draft that you can polish and turn that into a vision script that can really become the guiding or the driving force of your business. It's interesting. You know, it reminds me of my book, Will It Fly?, which is about finding a business and validating that idea. But it really starts internally with you and validating where where do you want to go personally in the next three to five years of your life. And that then becomes very similar to this, the guiding principle. And I love how this is specifically a similar exercise, but just for your business specifically related to team, products, marketing, and impact. And so I can imagine this being helpful such that when you come to a decision-making point or there's an opportunity in front of you, you can kind of just use this as a litmus test to see, well, does this actually fit into where I want to go here? Or does this perspective hire, you know, fit this vision that we have? Or are we getting the results that we actually shot out to, to get? What are some results that you're seeing from some of the people in your coaching program that are using this? Well, it's been huge. We gave them an advanced copy of the book, The Vision Driven Leader, and gave them an opportunity to read through it, formulate their own vision, and then report back. And they've seen extraordinary results. Now, in our coaching program in general, we track the metrics. You know, how much does the business grow? For example, that's an important metric to us. And in the first 12 months, our average coaching client, and we spend an entire day on vision, our average coaching client will grow their business by 61% in the first year. Wow. But that's not all. And this, is, and this is why a vision is so important. Our average coaching client shaves 11 hours off their work week. Now, how do those two things go together? Well, I would maintain that vision has got to be the foundation of meaningful productivity. In other words, you know, not all tasks, not all projects are created equal. You can spend a ton of time doing things that are, are really should be outside the scope of your vision but are not leading you anywhere. But once you have clarity about a vision, now, all of a sudden you have, and you kind of mentioned this before without using the word, but you have a filter, right? Mm -hmm. So you could decide which opportunities are relevant, which are a distraction. You can talk about which work is relevant, which work is just a distraction. So everybody can skinny down their workload because now we're focused on the vision and fulfilling that. We're not just trying to do everything, you know, sort of the shotgun approach. We're using a rifle to get laser locked on the stuff that matters. It becomes a filter and a, and a way to measure which priorities are, are important and which are not. Wow. Massively helpful. I think that this can either become something that people can embrace with welcome arms or often be afraid of because perhaps they internally know that they aren't really sure where they want to go. How do you begin to approach this process if or what are some of the questions you can ask yourself if you're just not even quite sure what the direction you want your business to be? You know, this is you know, this is a writer. I know this is a writer as a writer, too. But I don't get clear until I start writing. You know, like I might sit down and I think I'm going to be writing about one thing, but there's something about the process of writing. And, and I often quote this, I don't even know who said it originally, but thoughts disentangle themselves 
passing over the lips and through pencil tips. Sometimes we're not clear because we haven't subjected ourselves to the discipline of trying to write it down. Something about writing forces you to get clear, and particularly when it's a guided guided writing assignment like I've outlined in the book. And, you know, anybody can do this. I mean, we've had so many people, hundreds of people now that have gone through this exercise who wouldn't consider themselves a writer. And we say, look, this doesn't have to be some kind of beautiful prose. It could be a series of bullet points. The, mo- the most important thing is get it out of your head. You can polish it later. This is advice I give to writers, but it's true in coming up with a vision statement too. But you got to get clear. And I do, I spend a, a good amount of time in the first part of the book. What happens when you don't have a vision? Well, I went through a business failure because I didn't have a vision, but there's a lot at stake. Your people are counting on you to give the vision. You know, there was a there was a big research project I cited in the book where they said, what's the number one trait that people who work in companies look for in leadership? Well, the number one, as probably everybody could imagine, was integrity. Mm-hmm. Number two, vision. They want a leader who knows where he or she is taking the company because they know what happens when that's not present. You know, everybody is very busy. Everybody's doing a lot of work. Uh, but it's not going anywhere. And people can sense that. It's critical. Even if you don't feel like you can do this, you've got to do it. You can't delegate it. You can't hire it out. This is something you've got to ask yourself the question, where do I want to take this? What's personally interesting to me? What's compelling to me? What do I want to give my time and resources to? If you can't answer that question, what are you doing? Yeah, this sort of reminds me of the difference between that scrappy entrepreneur who's sort of starting and figuring things out, but not really kind of planning ahead, but just kind of being more reactive to what's happening in the market or selling products when they get interested in it or or what have you, versus somebody who is stepping up and into the CEO leadership space, which I remember that very particular moment in uh, around 2014, 2015, when I had to consciously tell myself, you know, I'm no longer just a, a scrappy entrepreneur. I have to step into this role as a CEO to go to where I want to go. I need to start building my team. I need to start thinking more clearly about where I want to go. And a lot of things happen as a result of just mentally stepping into that space. And 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 that doesn't necessarily mean you have to have, you know, a giant team. But when it comes to building a team and a scrappy entrepreneur, solopreneur is wanting to step into more of the CEO leadership space, what would be one or if not more hires that you would recommend a person start thinking about in order to help them get to where, where they want to go versus, you know, just hiring, you know, you know, a VA to answer emails. I know there's some really important people that need to be with you on this journey. Definitely. And so like my team right now is uh, 40 full-time people. We've got Openings on our webpage right now for 12 more because of the growth we've experienced the last couple of years. 40? Yeah, 40. Holy moly. Wow, that's yeah. incredible. And so I, I can tell you what the the different positions were. The first person I, I hired in my business, this is going to be different for different businesses, was a copywriter because that was consuming an enormous amount of my time. And so I hired a copywriter to take that, that load off me so I could fo- focus more on product development. The next person I hired was somebody to help me with content creation. And now I've got six people on my content creation team, which is phenomenal. Sometimes we'll have to talk about how we create content. It's, it's been an awesome thing to do as a team. And one of the first hires that I made, and this is one that a lot of people put off, was uh, I hired a bookkeeper. And now I've got a chief financial officer. And that's one of the most important hires to make to keep you on track. Yeah, I don't, you may be familiar with this uh, stat, but this comes from the U.S. Department of Commerce. But you know, there's about a million businesses started in the U.S. every year. New businesses started every year. Twenty percent of those will su- survive the first five years. In other words, eighty percent will go out of business within the first five years. Of those that survive, eighty percent of those that survive will go out of business in the next five years. So you basically have a four percent. If you run all the numbers there, you got a four percent chance of surviving ten years. So I do think that comes back to vision and it comes back to hiring the right teammates. Who are the people that are going to help me get to that vision? Because nobody just needs to hire people to hire people or hire people because you got more work than you can do. But you're hiring people to help you row the boat that's going to get you to the destination you envision. I love that. Thank you. Wow. I'm just kind of blown away because I remember when I uh, got familiar with your work in 2013 through Platform and Platform University and all that great stuff. Your team wasn't that big and now you've scaled up quite nicely. And how do you manage to 
stay sane while growing a business to this level. I personally don't have an interest to get to that scale. I have a team of about eight full-time people now, which is a good sweet spot for me. But when you go bigger than that, I mean, what are some of the things that you need to start thinking about in order to manage? Because that, that's a lot of people to take yeah. care of and, and a lot of moving parts and pieces. What's, what's your secret? Well, I would say, you know, I, 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 can't, I feel like I'm playing a, a one-string guitar, but I do think it comes back to vision. You know, we wouldn't have a team that big if we didn't have a clear vision. And the thing that keeps that from becoming complex and bureaucratic and more than any one person can manage is the vision, the discipline of that, staying focused. You know, as a result of that vision, for example, uh, we pruned out some pretty important products this last year, one of them you know of, yeah. uh, best year ever, just because we didn't see it in our future. You know, great program, had a, a wonderful season in our business. It's still alive I and mean, people can, can still buy it, but we're not spending a lot of effort on, you know, promoting it out there uh, mm -hmm. anymore because we just didn't see it as as part of our future. But I would say that if you if you do see your company growing bigger than eight people. And by the way, there was a point at which I saw, you know, eight people and I thought, this is probably, you know, it. This is this is enough. So I wouldn't be surprised, Pat. I'll just put this bug in your ear mm -hmm. that your team doesn't grow as your vision expands. We just shall saying. see. <laughs> just saying. We'll see. And, and, you know, bigger is not always better. So, I, you know, I, I certainly want to acknowledge that. But I do think that uh, if you're going to lead a team, the thing that they're counting on you for is that vision because they they need to have a, vil, a filter. They need sort of some overarching schema that guides their work, that tells them what's a distraction and what's an opportunity. Those often look like the same thing on the front end. But if you don't have a vision, you don't have a way of discerning uh, the difference. How do you get the, the team on board with your vision? I think that I can imagine cases where a leader will go to their team and say, this is where we're going and the team is just not happy or, okay, sure, boss, whatever you say. But how do you get them excited about the vision? How do you, how do you align them with you? Okay, here's the first and foremost important thing. You've got to be excited first. Yes. If it doesn't motivate you, people can sense it. You know, if you're just going through the motions, people know it. They can intuit that. People are a lot smarter than sometimes we give them credit for. But if you're jazzed about it, then you're going to communicate that enthusiasm. But it's not, this is not like a one and done communication thing. Like if you were to interview the employees at our company and said, what's the vision for Michael Hyatt and company, they might not give you the, the, you know, the, the letter of the law as it were, be able to, to quote from the vision script, but they're pretty clear. And it's because again, it's not a one and done thing where, you know, we did the vision thing, we got the vision script and now it's in a shelf, you know, on the bookcase. No, this is a living document. So let me just tell you what happens with us. So every year we have an annual team meeting. We just did this in January. We brought every, everybody together. We, I mean, every single person in the room. And uh, in the past, we've also invited spouses to that. We didn't do it this year, but typically we do because we want buy-in from the spouses as well. But not only do we report on the company's financial results and some of the big milestones that we achieved this past year, so it's really a time of celebration, but it's all also a time of vision casting. So I literally got up in front of the entire company and I read through the vision script. And in our case, it's a four page document, but I read it with conviction and with enthusiasm. I invited people to visualize it. I had somebody that had, had just started with the company about three months before that, who was in our customer service uh, department. She came up to me, she'd never spoken to me in her entire time at our company, three months. And she came up to me with tears in her eyes. And she said, I cannot tell you how motivating that is to know that I'm part of a bigger story gets me really, really excited. And that's pretty much the consistent response that our clients see with their employees when they get connected to the vision. Because all of a sudden, and, and here's the thing that people are desperate for, meaning. People want to know that what they do on a daily basis means something, that it's connected to a bigger story, that this is going somewhere, that their life matters. And it's your job as a leader to make sure that, that you connect the dots, that you connect that vision to their daily actions, but it can't even be once a year. So every quarter when our team gets together, we get together for one day, once a quarter, we call it team training, but we do a similar kind of thing on the, the annual. We review what's happened in the last quarter. We celebrate that. We set our goals for the next quarter and we read one of the four parts of our vision script, but I don't read it. Somebody on our team does it. So they kind of interpret it in a way, but we talk about it there. We talk about it in our daily work. 
When an opportunity comes up, we ask ourselves, does this square with our vision? Can I just give you a, a piece of our vision? Yeah, please. So like this is a part of our vision script and this is under the team framework. And by the way, we, we highly recommend that people write this in the present tense so that you begin to believe that it's happening. As it turns out, all the brain science says that your mind can't differentiate between something vividly imagined and something you're actually experiencing. This is why in the world of professional athlete, uh, athletics, that a part of the practice regimen is actually visualizing the practice. Somebody asked Michael Phelps one time when he was just kind of looked like he was staring blankly into space before a race. They said, are you envisioning the finish? And he said, no. He said, I'm going through mentally every single stroke. Why? Because that rehearsal, that mental rehearsal was key to performance. Okay. So this is in the team section of the script. This is one of the things we say. Our employees experience reasonable autonomy, planning and executing their own work without the impediment of overbearing management, stifling bureaucracy, or procedural red tape. We encourage innovation and experimentation. If something doesn't work, we learn from it and move on. That guides the policies that we set up in HR, the way that we manage. We do not micromanage. You know, we have an office, beautiful office. Nobody's required to come in. Nobody's required to keep office hours. Everybody's invited to come in, but we really don't care. We're looking at the results. We want people to have reasonable autonomy. Daniel Pink says in his book, Drive, that that's one of the three key elements for retaining people, for retaining the best talent. They've got to feel like they've got autonomy. But it also informs policies like we have a no-hassle uh, software policy, where if you feel like you need an app, you don't have to get approved by your boss. You don't have to get it approved by some you know, central IT department. Just buy it. You know, we trust you. You're an adult. So that vision informs how we run the business. And that's the key thing that I, I, I think people need to understand about vision. I really love that. I think, I mean, now I want to go work for you for a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> this is really cool. Uh, you had mentioned earlier the content team and how you all put together your content. And it's really neat. I'd love to learn a little bit more about how you do that, especially with multiple team members involved. Yeah, this has been really fun and this has been a journey for me. But, you know, in the old days, let's just take uh, a book, for example. I wrote every word. And as you know from writing books, it's a ton of work, it's a right? <laughs> and it's it's like daunting. And there were, uh, I mean, almost every book I, I wrote, um, there was a point at which I wanted to throw in the towel and just say, you know, this is just too hard. What was I thinking? You know, I've sold myself into something I can't complete. But, you know, eventually work through the messy middle and, and complete it. So now what I have with the content team, we follow something I call the 10-80-10 principle. It's also a principle I teach to our coaching clients, and it works not just in content development, but in almost anything if you're in a position of leadership. And that is where you're involved in the first 10% of the project and involved in the last 10% of the project, but other people who are more gifted in the middle parts of the project take that on. So for example, now when, when we do a book or we do a podcast or we you know set up a, one of our, our coaching days, one of our workshops, I'll go in and brainstorm with the team, take several hours, sometimes a day, maybe two days if it's a book, and just do a brain dump. Everything I know about that, everything I've thought about it, you know, we sketch on the whiteboard, all that stuff. Then the team takes it. This is the 80%. They do the research. They find the case studies. They interview the clients. They do all that tough stuff in the middle that, frankly, I hate. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the hardest part of the work. Then it comes back to me for my fine-tuning, for my review, and ultimately for my approval. And that's how we produce almost every piece of content today. 10-80-10. 10-80-10. It allows you to accomplish so much more than you can do when you're responsible for the whole part of the project. And this, this really goes back to something, Pat, I talk about in my book, Free to Focus, about the desire zone, where your passion and your proficiency come together. Mm -hmm. You know, that creates the greatest leverage for you personally and, frankly, creates the greatest leverage for the company. When you stay in your lane and you're doing your desire zone activities, you're satisfied, you're happy, you're fulfilled. When you stray outside of that, that's when life becomes, you know, drudgery. And so for me, there's really today in my business, there's only three things that I do. You know, I create content, I deliver content, and I work on the vision. Other than that, that's somebody else's work. And I just, I say, no, I pass it to somebody else that's more equipped to do it. And even within the content creation, there are certain parts of that that I'm better equipped to do than the other parts. 
Like I'm great on the ideation part of it, building frameworks, coming up with the overarching part of it, but filling in the details, you know, the, the case studies, all the things I talked about, the research, that's not in my desire zone. That's not the best and highest use of me. And this is why we build a team so that we can do these things and only work on the things that we want to do. And this is why I have my team and it sounds like uh, you get to do things that you love to do as well. And the, the machine just keeps running, which is yep, fantastic. Exactly. I also want to talk about, you had mentioned the four parts, team, products, sales and marketing, uh, and then impact. I want to talk about marketing and sort of scripting the vision for marketing because that yeah. seems like, a means to an end, but you're scripting the the the, the methods and, and the how to to get to the impact, to get to uh, the, the results that you want. So what might a script look like for marketing in particular? Yeah, let me just read a few parts out of the Michael Hyatt and Company vision script as it relates to sales and marketing. So we say, we start by saying kind of an overarching statement. We employ customer acquisition strategies that make our offers irresistible. So here's what we say, and, you, and you'll see where we got this in a minute. We understand our clients and customers are the real heroes. We serve as a guide, offering a plan that helps them overcome the obstacles, their obstacles, and achieve their desired transformation. So that's, you know, story brand from Don Miller 101. Right, exactly. Okay, then we say this. We offer our products from a profound sense of what it's, what's at stake, both positively and negatively. Therefore, we believe selling and marketing are a noble an essential activity that we exercise without apology. As such, we confidently call our customers to action, believing our products are precisely what they need to help them get what they want. So, you know, I, I think a lot of times people in sales and marketing, you know, depending on your background or whatever, feel a little bit like they're, you know, I don't know, second rate citizens in the company, you know, that what they do is, you know, not quite clean, not noble. And we're saying no. Do you understand what's at stake? I mean, it's critical that we get the message about our products out to people. And the people that are involved in that are doing something really important and something really special. And so we want to elevate them. I love that. I love I love the positioning there. And I think that's something that we all need to hear that selling uh, is noble. I often say you can sell and serve at the same time. And uh, for a sales team that you might have, because I know that I've uh, you know been on floors where there's the sales team in the corner, but they're often the most hardworking, but they're often... Uh, are the least appreciated because they're just about the numbers. Um, I think that when you can put perspective into it with the human element and the fact that, well, we are creating solutions and helping people out, well, selling becomes crucial. It becomes the most important thing or else no transformation would happen. So I, I, I really absolutely love that. And to finish off here, I, I you know, again, everybody should check out the Vision Driven Leader. You can probably get on Amazon. Is there any special page you want people to go to to, to see it instead? Absolutely. We'd encourage you to go to visiondrivenleader.com slash smart, as in smart passive income, because we have a special suite of bonuses for people to visit that page. All you got to do is buy the book wherever better books are sold. Go to that page and you can redeem using your receipt a whole suite of bonuses, including you get the free audiobook. You get the free ebook there. You get a tool that we've created that's online that's amazing called the Vision Scripter Tool that will actually walk you through the, the process online to get you a draft of your script. And that's the Vision Driven Leader? No, or just visiondrivenleader.com slash smart. Perfect. And we'll have that link to you in the show notes as well. To finish off, I'd like to have us discuss a little bit about just sort of leader energy levels, because I think that especially in the moments of developing a script like this and thinking about the future and the vision for the company, it can get really exciting. And then you present it to the team, everything's going. But then of course, within the lives of our business, there are moments where we're feeling down, the dip, if you will. What are some strategies that you employ for yourself and your team to get that energy back so that we can realize that vision when perhaps we had a failed launch, for example, or uh, things just didn't go to plan or something happened that was unexpected that threw us off the rails? How do we get back on the rails and toward this vision that we have? Well, Pat, there's so many of these things that relate to mindset, but I, I think the single most important thing you bring to your team, apart from vision, is your energy. It determines everything inside of your company. People cue off you. That's part of what it means to be a leader for good or for bad. Mm -hmm. People are going to pick up on your energy and they're going to reflect it. But I think that's where we've got to be the thermostat, not the thermometer. It's not original with me. Somebody else said it, but I think it's a beautiful metaphor. We got to be the thermostat. We set 
the temperature or the energy inside of our company. Therefore, as leaders, one of the most important things we can do is manage our energy level. And when it comes to that, and I, boy, I manage my energy. I'm, I'm a lot older than you, so I really have to manage my energy. But I'm very thoughtful about it. So for me, it begins with something very simple, but it's probably the single most important thing when it comes to energy, and that's the amount of sleep you get. Do, do you ever notice when you get tired, how much dumber everybody gets? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, it's not them, it's you. Because you just, you know, sleep is key to productivity, it's key to focus, it's key to energy. You know, when I, when I wake up in the morning and I've slept eight hours, and that's my goal, eight hours, the average adult needs eight to 10 hours, so I'm on the short side of that. Unfortunately, about 78% of Americans get six hours of sleep or less. But to get eight hours of sleep, it's amazing what that does to your energy level. What you eat is important. Whether or not you exercise is important. We're not talking about health here. We're talking about how you can be the best leader for your business. And you've got to manage that energy. How you show up every day matters. What happens when you get a, a setback like you were talking about? You know, a launch doesn't go as, as well as it should. I mean, you know, we experience that constantly. People looking from the outside in say, you know, everything you guys touch turns to gold. And people probably say the same thing to you, Pat. That's absolutely not true. You know, we've, we've had a lot of failures, a lot of things that didn't work as well as, as we had hoped. But the key in terms of maintaining your energy and the key to getting through that successfully is to be able to process failure in a powerful way. And there's a whole you know, series of things I could say on that. But failure is inevitable. Failing is optional. So mm. taking that, that failure, being able to metabolize that, and I think it begins, first of all, by owning it. What will prolong failure, what will send you into the death spiral is when you're in that sort of victim mentality where you're blaming everybody else. So my business, I tell the story in the book, The Vision Driven Leader, at the front of the book, I started the publishing company in 1984. After five years and enormous growth, we outran our capital and we went broke. In fact, we didn't have enough assets to declare bankruptcy because there was nothing to distribute. Everything had been pledged in loans, but we went broke. And at first, we wanted to blame the distributor that didn't deliver the sales that they had promised. And in fact, we met with a lawyer and we thought we were going to file a lawsuit against the distributor. And the lawyer said, look, I'll do this if you want. It's going to take a retainer, by the way, but I'll do this if you want. But I want to just kind of give you a preview of what your life's going to look like. You're going to spend the next three years in and out of court, having to answer questions about every decision you ever made. And at the end of it, even if you win, you're not going to get what you think and you're going to end up angry and bitter. He said, I want you guys to think about it over the weekend. So we did. So my partner and I thought about it. We came back and we said, you know what? The truth is we got into that relationship with the distributor. Nobody held the gun to our head. It was our fault. We didn't do our due diligence. Once we owned that, all of a sudden the power came back to us. We realized we weren't victims. We could begin to change the future. We could begin to change the outcome. And we went on, both of us, very successful careers after that. But you got to be able to process that failure. You got to be able to metabolize it so that you can use it to grow and, I, and I've often said about that experience, you know, it's never one, it's not one that I would ever want to repeat, but it's one that I wouldn't trade for any amount of money because that was the beginning of my education as an entrepreneur. And that has served me so, so well through the years. Here, here. I hope that encourages everybody because we all go through failure, failures all the time, but failing is optional. I really love that. Thank you. Michael, I appreciate you coming on and spending time. I know you're busy, especially with the book launch coming up, but The Vision Driven Leader is the book. Head on over to visiondrivenleader.com slash smart and you can pick up all those goodies there. Mike, always a pleasure having you on. Thank you so much. And I look forward to connecting with you and fishing again with you and all that great stuff. Uh, yeah, we gotta do it. Hopefully very soon. Thanks so much. Cheers. All right, I hope you enjoyed that interview with Michael Hyatt. You can find his book again at visiondrivenleader.com slash smart. Go ahead and check it out there. And thank you again, Michael, for coming on. I always appreciate it. And I hope we get to go fishing again very soon. For those of you listening, you're amazing. If you wanna check out the resources and the links mentioned in this episode, head on over to smartpassiveincome.com slash session 417. Once again, smartpassiveincome.com slash session 417. Just wanna say, I appreciate y'all. Thank you for listening in. Team Flynn, you're amazing. And make sure if you haven't done so already, head on over to Apple Podcasts and leave a review for the show if you have the opportunity to do so. And if you haven't yet subscribed, well, now's the time to do it because then you're also gonna see all the other amazing content that's available for you right now too. So Team Flynn, thank you so much. And as always, Team Flynn for the win. Peace. 
Thanks for listening to the Smart Passive Income Podcast at www.smartpassiveincome.com. Hey, if you're looking for a new podcast to add to your rotation, I've got one for you. It's called Dirty Money, and it's like a hybrid between a true crime and a business podcast. So hosts Jonathan Small and Dan Bova tell the tales of legendary scammers, con artists, and barely legal lowlifes who stop at nothing to rake in millions. Recent episodes include a man who looted $100 million from his own company. Crazy. Give it a listen. Head on over to Dirty Money right now on Apple Podcasts, Google, Spotify, or Stitcher.